There's three questions with Darina Sackman Ebwa. All right. I like I stuttered a little bit. I tried. That was awesome. Okay. All right. So Darina and I connected at South Carolina AMLE. She wrote like the nicest tweet about me ever after and like basically made me cry. I'm like, that's mean. And so I was like, anyway, so we just started connecting and we were going to record this podcast like an hour ago, but we've just been talking. And Darina, you are awesome. I love your stuff. And so uh, thanks so much for taking the time to be on the podcast. And a fellow Floridian too, right? Yes, I am. And you're right there in Orlando where my husband was born and raised. And that's where I did. Like ever the New Yorker, we took over the state of Florida. I apologize <laughs> <did>. for <laughs> But yes, we moved to Central Florida. Now I live on a farm about four hours from you and I'm loving every minute of it. But what I really enjoyed was our conversation for like an hour talking about stuff. And I saw your keynote. I saw your work. And now I'm here talking to you. So it's just pretty amazing. Actually, this is awesome. Okay, just just so you know. Okay, I got to bring this up. I know this doesn't have anything to do with the podcast. You're right with the New York thing. So I have season tickets to Orlando Magic. It is so fun, right? Yeah. The rowdiest crowd is when the Knicks fans show up. It is like, I'm like, is anyone from Florida here? It is all Knicks. This is all Knicks people. And they are so, so loud. It is crazy. Oh, in, in all Orlando sports, it's kind of funny because when the Bucks play the Jets, that's exactly what happens. Um, when you go watch the Tampa Bay Lightning play the New York Rangers, not the Islanders, <laughs> uh, they, it is all Ranger jerseys, like even Messier in the back, which is like, oh, what? Yeah. That's like 1994. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you, everyone listening to this right now, you're going to get to know Dorita. And goes by Miss Dorito too a little bit, right? Where did the Miss Dorito thing come from? I don't, is it just because Dorita? Like what's going on there? Well, as, as you can see, I'm wearing a lab coat and every day I wear a lab coat to school for the past yeah. like 16 years. And it's black shirt, black pants, lab coat, whatever. It's because I want kids to see like professionalism, but also yeah. a lot of pockets. And yeah. plus I roll out of bed to get to work, right? That's why the head's in the messy bun. Let's have some fun, double chin. Miss Dorina. And it was Miss Dorina right there. And the kids said, because they were learning English, often English learners associate something they already recognize. They saw the Doritos, they saw Dorina, and they couldn't change it. They just called me Miss Dorina. So it's kind of like kids will say chicken instead of kitchen, or they'll say happy birthday instead of birthday, or Chinese food instead of China. So as you're learning a language, you associate right. with something you see. And so then Dorito, Dorito, Dorito. I'm like, just put a miss in front of it, and I'm fine. That and the kids, crazy. so for like 16 years, I've been Miss Dorito. <laughs> you're so awesome. Uh, all right, so we're going to get into this podcast because it is actually, just so you know, it is your birthday. So do you know what you get from me from your birthday? A little special... <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. All right. So let's get into the podcast. So you are such an inspiring person. And I know you, you, you just anyone that I've connected with that knows you, knows your work, just says how you totally like fill them up. Like they're pushed by the content that you share, but just feel so I it's kind of interesting because it's like you you have that perfect balance of like making people feel people feel really appreciated really love but also they want to get better after they talk to you so they're challenged but they're lead to action which i think is a really incredible thing and so you've inspired so many people and so when you look back at your career in education you think about your experiences as a kid you know in schools who's a teacher that really inspired you and why it's tough to choose from three miss smith my third grade teacher mr understein my eighth grade history teacher and again another history teacher my 10th grade social studies teacher brother gary cregan and of all three of them, they all have this same, what I call TLC squared, tough love culture and tender loving care, that balance of both of them. But I will say it's going to go to Brother Gary. I went through K through eight public, then nine through 12 private. Um, my parents just wanted to set me up for a college that I didn't go to. They were mad, but I digress. <laughs> so, whatever. They knew they should have put me in public. I digress. But the point is, is that Brother Gary, what he did is that he saw that I was struggling a lot. Um, and he saw that one of the things that he did see me struggle with was my notes. My notes were backwards. Okay. I write backwards. I prefer to write backwards. Mm -hmm. um, and he saw that and he just turned around and said, when I was trying to write forwards in a Catholic school in the eighties, um, I was trying to write forwards. And um, when I was writing backwards, they were like, what is going on? So I was analyzed by a school psychologist and this and that. And I'm like, what's going on? And he said, I got the best thing for you. And he actually got me a three ring binder with tracing paper and said, do everything on this. I'll just flip oh, it over and I'll read it. So that form of differentiated instruction and seeing me at who I was put me more intrinsically motivated to pay attention in the classroom because Brother Gary saw me. But he saw me with TLC squared. 
He knew I was a sensitive person. He knew I really had to really focus, but he never, ever, he said, I love you. I'm going to take care of you, but you got to work. And mm -hmm. the push with the love was the balance I needed and inspired me to be a teacher today. So it's brother Gary all the way. All right, brother Gary. <laughs> Give a shout out. Uh, so that's, that's awesome. And you, you know, this obviously, it, it's interesting listening to you talk about that because obviously it affected you tremendously as a learner. Yeah. But you also were Florida Teacher of the Year, right? So I'm talking, I don't know if you're like royalty. I don't know if I have to like, there's like some <laughs> special designation I got to refer to you here. But you were like the one of the finalists for National Teacher of the Year. Yeah. And like you must have taken some of those approaches, obviously, and implement them in your own classroom, correct? Like things that you learned as a kid and that experience. Is that, is that something you did? Uh, and I'm only going to say from the feedback watching my classroom. So from the uh, my district teacher of the year, I remember the people who came in to observe me, they left the room crying. And I said, what were you crying about? And they said, you, every single child was engaged, but you loved them individually. And we didn't, mm -hmm. we were confused at how you worked with them individually. That's why I'm a proponent of differentiated instruction. Mm -hmm. And then when the Florida teacher of the year thing happened and they took a video of my class, they said the exact same thing, which was authenticity with individuality. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was pretty interesting that they all kind of saw a pattern that I individually saw every child and pushed them, but still with that love. So I took everything that I learned from Mr. Smith, Mr. Understein, and then also Brother Gary and brought it into the classroom for English learners. And just my ability. I mean, I can't balance my checkbook. One plus one is 11 to me. I've just got <laughs> But I speak five languages and it's not about speaking the language of the students, but it's about understanding the breakdown of how to acquire a second language that I had empathy towards the kids, but also to push them. And again, I can't stress it enough. That's what you have to do with that balance. And that's what makes a real well-rounded teacher. But a lot of times people either start, first try to be the lovey teacher and be the friend. And then all of a sudden you're not really doing instruction or the don't smile till Christmas kind of attitude yeah. of the you know, passe way of teaching. But when you have that balance of both along with seeing kids where they are plus one. So where they are plus one is what I always say with the kids. And that's what I think is the, the best way to, to really see kids to be intrinsically motivated to learn. You know, so one of the things I, so I, I do these workshops on helping people become speakers and, I, and it's interesting and, I, and I, I think you'll appreciate it. I always say you have to find that balance of being a cold shower and a warm bath, <gasps> right? And that's what you're trying to do because I've seen the cold shower speaker and I've seen the warm bath speaker and it's like, don't ever change. I'm like, maybe change a bit, <laughs> right? Like, Little. like we can, we are all, we're asking kids to grow and get better, but don't ever change is not sitting well with me. Right. But you know, it also has to feel, people have to feel appreciated. So that I love, I love that analogy. So I can't wait. I, to I, have to, I have to give you a little credit too, because you say warm bath and and the and the nice hot shower, warm bath, cold shower. But yep. but you know, think of the bath with Epsom salt. That's the way you present. Uh, <laughs> you know, you just add that little bit extra for that <laughs> lovely cooling, and then you also have like the eucalyptus spray that hangs right there. So you have that extra aura. You know what I'm saying? That's what I appreciate about you, and why I'm talking to you on this podcast oh, as opposed okay. to other people. All right, enough of that. Okay, so all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't. I actually, I'm so excited to talk to you more about the the English, the EL, and I. What what was the? It's kind of there's a new term. Is it multi? It is. It is changing. So it used to be English language learners (ELL). Then it went to multilingual learners, or um, because the State Department of Education and the center OELA.org, the Office of English Language Acquisition. On paper, they'll use ELL and ML interchangeably, but spoken, they'll use multilingual learners. Now, Texas and other in Virginia, they might use EB, which is emergent bilinguals. So it really is a preference. Right. All right. So we're gonna talk, we're gonna talk a lot about this because I'm like really fascinated about which, but we gotta keep going with this one. So okay. I could talk to you all day. This is gonna be trouble. All right. So you've had a lot of administrators that you worked with, and probably just like every other teacher. Right. You've had something that you're like, oh, that person's awesome. And another one's like, oh, that one's not awesome. So yeah, right. And so when you think of an administrator that you worked with, maybe has a kid, who's someone that really inspired you and why? Dr. Miller. Dr. Miller. Uh, Dr. Miller worked in Orange County Public Schools. Uh, he was my first teacher when I moved to Florida from Massachusetts when I was a teacher there. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you that this was a very thing, very hard thing for me to answer. Um, because I will tell you that there is a shortage of honest leadership. 
Um, I think there's a lot of principles and good people that are well-intended, but I don't think that they are. Um, I think we need to have better uh, mentorship towards excellent leadership for teachers to really feel comfortable and safe in a classroom and, uh, and in an environment. That's one thing I had to get out there. So it was hard for me in my 20 years of teaching to find that one person, but Dr. Miller was one of them. And one of the reasons is that, again, he saw people as individuals, pushed them, was a huge delegator, and he also was not a micromanager, mm -hmm. um, but he was a boss. And you wanted, to, you were extrinsically motivated as well as intrinsically motivated. But I worked in uh, what is now Roberto Clemente Middle School, but it was at the point at that time, Jackson Middle School. Mm -hmm. um, and it, he just really knew how to put a team together and have a collective agency and yet giving autonomy. And I think that that was it. He knew you were an expert. He let you go. He observed it, gave you feedback, but it was through the lens of appreciative inquiry. Everything was, okay, this is good, rather than checkbox of what you're doing wrong on your evaluation. It was a constant. And this is the one principle I would see all the time, all the time, to the point where once I finally left, I actually was the nanny for his kids. Uh, yeah. So that, that is Dr. Miller. Yeah, that was uh, Dr. Miller. Great you know, man. Okay. I, I love this. I actually wrote down the notion of honest leadership. I'm going to ask you more about that uh, on the next, <clears throat> excuse me, on the next podcast. You know, I was, I can't remember who I was talking to about this, but, and I, and I, and I'm curious your thoughts. I, I said, you know, I'm sure that when I, you know, a lot of people really appreciated me when I was a principal and really liked me, but I pushed and I wanted you to get better. And I also know some people are like, thank God he's gone. And, I, yes. and to be honest with you, I'm okay with that. Like, it, and that's okay because it wasn't that I didn't appreciate it, but sometimes people are just maybe at a point in their lives, they don't want to be pushed anymore. They don't want to grow and stuff like that too. Whereas I found, and I, I feel this with your personality, just having conversations with you today, is that if somebody didn't push you and didn't mentor you, you'd be like disappointed. You're like, seriously, like I'm here to get better too, right? And I don't know if everybody's like that. And I'm not just talking to education. I'm talking to every profession too, right? Like we want to get, I want to get better. And if I, if I feel I've outgrown leadership, I'm out, I'm leaving. Right. Or worse, I'm staying and I'm going to get worse. Right. Mm. Which is not good. So I, I, I'll ask you more about that too. Cause I, I love that, that notion of honest leadership. All right. So last question. And even, and you are such a good embodiment of this because you and I were just talking shop before and it was just amazing. And you are like, I guarantee you there, there, I see your wheel spinning. You're always trying to do new things and it's just incredible, but I guarantee you as incredibly accomplished as you are as an educator, there's stuff that you, in your first year, like, Oh, seriously, I used to do that. Like every other person, you know, that's ever taught. And I always say this, if you don't regret things you did in your first year, you probably suck right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> And it's not that you weren't making an impact then, but we all should get better, right? That's a really important thing. So you look back at your first year, what advice would you give to Darina that first year of teaching? Wow. First thing, without a doubt, uh, do not try to please everybody, okay? Mm -hmm. That is especially your students, okay? You, again, try that TLC square, the tough love culture. That's a tough thing, but do not try to be their friend. The second thing is... Um, get your lesson plans, learn how to really write them. Don't fly by the seat of your pants as good as you may be and say, I'm better under pressure. I love the sense of urgency. I'm chasing the dopamine, right? Uh, all that kind of stuff. It's really write your lesson plans and really reflect on your practice. Journal your practice rather than just, I just did it. Uh, see kids as individuals without a doubt. Uh, and also definitely don't try to don't try to do too much the first year because you think you want to be the teacher of the year. <laughs> right, don't right. try to like sit there and be like, I want to do this and I'll volunteer. I'll volunteer. No one should be doing anything for the first three years because you'd be focusing on those kids, right. right? As much as you want to be the volleyball coach, there are certain things that you have to do. Um, the joke of all jokes, stay out of the, the teacher lounge. If there even is one anymore. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's a huge one. And the biggest one also become friends with, you know, the, 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 the unbelievable staff that helps that school keep such as the custodial staff, as well as the administrative assistants. Um, but the other one, take a desk out of your house, out of your room. And the format of your room, do not sit, don't have a desk in your room. If you do, you have a stand up one. You have that desk, you have a tendency to get complacent and you'll sit behind that desk to have order with those kids. And you don't want that. When you have that desk, you sit behind that desk and it's a sense of authority, almost like a, uh, a podium when you're speaking. I don't right. like podiums because it has this 
air and or no, you have to be within the kids. And it also forces you to go within and out of the classroom, walking around. You have a good, comfortable chair. That's another thing. But that desk place breeds complacency. And I know you're going to be tired and that's fine, but that's good. You have a place to sit during your, right. your planning time. But that's one thing that I would say, get that desk out of yourself and, and make sure you do everything online rather than have all these papers everywhere. And, right. uh, Balance, balance yourself. Don't stay after, you know, give yourself, you can stay after as much as you want, but have that, not the teach. I don't like that work-life balance. I don't like that. I hate that half step, yeah. self-care kind of thing. But what I'm talking <laughs> about is, you know, I just, that word is being used too much in education yeah. anyway. But the fact is, is that you have to say to yourself, wait a second, I have got to realize that I'm someone outside of just being a teacher because my identity became a teacher so quickly because I love what I do. But at the same time, I needed to step away from teaching because I wound up with that compassion fatigue because I love my babies so much. You right. have to learn immediately to whatever it is that it'll take, mentorship and accept constructive feedback from good people. Accept it. Don't be so stubborn. You are awesome. And you know, one thing I always say, like we have to ensure that we are humans that just happen to be teachers, not teachers that happen to be humans, right? Like that is a really important aspect and i think that it's important for kids to see too that we have outside interests that we like hey we love our jobs we love what we do but also you know like i like going to basketball games i you know i love connecting my family i'm a big dog guy right and i think those connect us on such a, a different level and i know that's why people connect with you so well i love talking to you and i can't wow. wait to dig in more um everyone if you don't follow Darina, make sure you follow Darina because she is incredible and she will just make you better. And I, I love it. And I think um, the administrator that you talked about, I can see you do that for so many people right now. And I so appreciate it. Thank you so much. It really has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. You're awesome. You're the best. <laughs>